Sunday, June 12th, 1994. It's about 10, 10.30 in the morning. I am uh, getting ready uh, for like a late brunch uh, with my family. We're uh, living at the time in Mexicali, Baja California, Mexico, which is the most uh, northern uh, Latin city in the world, also the hottest. If there was a hell, that's probably what they based it on. Right now it's about 120 degrees. But in June, it's still a really, very cool, 95, 100 degrees, still not as bad. <laughs> and uh, we're like chilling. Uh, what usual things that we do on a, on a Sunday morning, we'll wake up late, we're gonna be watching TV. Mom is bringing food into the, into the living room. Once we're done with the food, uh, my mom and my sister, they decide, you know, we're gonna go out for a while, we're gonna take the, at this point we have a little baby sister, they're gonna t take her out for a walk. Uh, my stepdad, uh, he's, um, he said he's gonna go work on a, like a, we're building a, an extra room in the back of the house. And he goes there and starts um, doing some, you know, construction, some electrical wiring that he was gonna work on. And for me, as a regular uh, teenager at the time, I said, you know, I'm gonna go upstairs and just listen to music. That's what I do. And I go to the, go upstairs, open the room, I open the window so the air from the, from the AC can kind of flow freely because it's, still hot as Hades, and I turn on the boom box, and I just have both my hands on the boom box, and I'm just listening to like the music, if I like it, if I don't like it, switch to the next one. And all of a sudden, I hear this loud bang, like metal, bam! Followed by this shout, ah! Like desperate shouting. Hold on a second, I lower the volume. It didn't seem like it belonged. I get closer to the window, and I don't hear anything. Go back to the boom box, and something just didn't feel right inside. I start walking downstairs. Mom? Hello? Nobody's there. I walk uh, outside of the the house, I look in front of the house and there's nothing happening. It's still something didn't feel right. I go to the corner, corner I turn to the right, uh, and there's my stepfather's body on the ground. He's not moving, and uh, I can see a, a drill uh, laying uh, next to him still on. At times I can still remember the vibration I run towards the, uh, the street and hears me shouting from side to side, help, help, help. Neighbors start gathering around. What happened, what happened? Here's what happened. We go to the body, try to slap him in the face. He's not waking up. And they look at me, this still little kid, and said, what do you want to do? I said, oh, I don't know, like, help me take him to the front of the house. That's the only thing I could think of. Each one of us gra grab a limb, we carry him to the front yard. Uh, somebody shouts, please, call the uh, emergency. Somebody runs to the phone. I can see like the, like the head starting pile up on, on the fence on each side. People line up in the front of the fence on the other side. And uh, we just wait there. I mean, it felt like forever. We're in Mexico, so there's no like official like 911. There's no ambulances all over the place. So you can imagine just like desperate time of waiting there. And the longer you wait, the shorter that hope gets. And finally, you can hear the ambulance at a distance. And I'm just looking at the my watch and thinking, oh my gosh, how can this be taking so long? Finally, they show up, they come out, they bring a little bag, and they lay next to the body and they start doing whatever they do. They pull a syringe, they try to put something in. They... And I'm standing there with everyone just looking at me, staring at the body of my stepdad. And finally, one of the paramedics just looks up on me and says, he's gone. And I'm thinking, no, like, wait, hold on a second. We're like having breakfast like a few minutes ago. 
and I still like not willing to believe it, I I got down on my knees and uh, looking for the evidence uh, for myself, I put the ear on his chest. And I could swear that I could still hear like the slightest beat of a heartbeat. I'm like, guys, like I can still hear it. It's like, what? So they pull something else, they hear a heartbeat, they pull a syringe and they pull it into his, uh, uh, his veins. And I can see it's just like a bubble, like it didn't go anywhere, so it just accumulates on the vein. And it's just there. They do something else. And I just, he, they say, I'm sorry. And I go again with my ear to his chest. And I kid you not, I hear like the slightest beat of a heartbeat that keeps getting softer and softer and softer. until there isn't any. I look up and I still see the, the heads of everybody looking on the other side of the fence. The people looking at me for an answer and I just feel like the world is spinning in circles and I don't know which way is up. His body starts turning purple and I'm just overwhelmed with questions like, what the fuck did just happen? I was having breakfast just a few minutes ago and life as I knew it just ended in front of me. How could this have happened? And I have to stand up and I have to go out and look for my mother and have the hardest conversation of my life. I walk out the fence, people start moving to the sides and there she is, lay, just leaning against the car. And she doesn't know what happened. It's like, that's, that's what she asked me. What happened? And I, the only thing I could think of is, Mom, it's gonna be okay. But what happened? I simply hold her hand and say, it's going to be okay. And at this point, she loses it. She starts slamming the car, just crying to herself and trembling. And I'm holding to her hand as she's losing control. And I'm thinking to myself, I just really don't know. Because life, as I knew, as I knew it, just ended. Why is this uh, a story important in my life? For, for many reasons. But there's two particular ones. Um, that was uh, the, uh, the end of my junior year in high school. And at that point, um, it was a crucial year of my life because I had decided at that point that I was an atheist. I was raised in Catholicism and uh, like every other Mexican boy, you like mariachi, you play soccer, you're gonna love tequila one day. <laughs> and you're gonna be a Catholic, because that's what it is. School taught me, my mom taught me, the government taught me, that's what it is. And I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go against the culture of my country, and here in atheist I will be. But at that point, when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm seeing my stepfather's body turn purple, things just didn't make sense, like meaning had abandoned me and a huge vacuum opened up with this desperation of lack of answers. Is this really all there is? That a body just turns purple out of nowhere, you were having breakfast, he goes out, you hear a shout, Mom? And the following year goes one of the hardest uh, periods of my life. I joined a gang, I started running from the, from the cops left and right, I'm getting into trouble, ditching school, uh, get beat up by the Mexican army, not the story there. And uh, the following, uh, within that year, uh, there's a group of missionaries that come from the United States uh, and they bring their support and they're bringing counsel and they bring toys. And through that uh, process, I become an evangelical. And just, I mean, within that period, eventually, fast forward a little bit, 
You heard the description. I become head of youth and adult ministries for the Foursquare denomination in the state of Baja California. And I'm speaking in tongues and casting demons. I'm preaching from the pulpit that homosexuality is an abomination. Not only that, but that like uh, AIDS was invented by God to punish you for the sin of homosexuality. That probably AIDS was started because, you know, uh, guys were having sex with monkeys. Obviously. I move on and I move to Azusa Pacific University, the second largest evangelical college in the nation. And here I'm traveling all over the world as a missionary. I'm going to Africa, Latin America, Europe, and all over the place, preaching the same kind of values that there is uh, absolute, that obviously the atheist community is just simply community that's being used by Satan. They don't understand purpose. They don't know the things that I have seen. After eight years with them, I become head of youth and young adult ministries for the United Methodist Church in Southern California, Hawaii, Women Saipan. And at this moment, they call me the face of emerging Methodism. And I go and preach and so on and so forth. Because of that moment that happened on that Sunday on June 12th, 1994, there was an avalanche of effect that happened. And I look back now at that time and I, I, I cannot describe to you the guilt that can exist in this individual that has created. Now that I've come out as a gay atheist, you think of that time, the people that I counsel and say, no, this is like the devil is tempting you into all these things. People that I counsel and, and leaving that. Why is it important at this moment? I sit here and I look at a room filled with, dare I say, majority experienced folks, beautiful as you are, uh, baby boomers, right? When this happened in my life, there was a huge vacuum. I didn't have a meaning in my life, and the only ones that came into my rescue was the evangelical community because they have a system of reaching out to people. They have a system of saying, I love you. There's a system of saying you belong with us. There's a system of people say, I'm not sure that you're not alone. But when it comes to the atheist community, they were so comfortable going to the darn conferences and reading research papers, but not going out and reaching to the one that is lost, the ones that is broken. The atheist community was very comfortable going to the marches. We're gonna go and march for LGBT, LGBT rights. We're gonna, make, we're gonna march, make sure you can have an abortion. We're gonna make, march for whatever else. But when it comes to the brokenness of the individual, well, that's probably the job for someone else. And the atheist community did not reach out to that Fernando and eventually went out. And I know as I look into the stories of the people that I preached with, the people that were there in the congregations with me, the people that I saw there when I was going out into the world, the same concept was there. Yeah, the atheists, they do their conferences, they go on marches, but when brokenness happens in the life of, the, of a little kid, they're probably reading some research paper somewhere. It must be really interesting, but in that time when it matters, I didn't find them. And that's why, uh, I know, in a way I like the word humanism, you know, expresses that there's a particular human value. You know, my book is called To the Cross and Back, and uh, I do talk about like, the journey, what went there. And if you uh, read the story, there's several stories like that, but it always comes out to that moment that I was on a search. I was not a crazy individual, I was not a stupid individual, I was not, I was looking for belonging, for someone to tell me you matter, for someone to tell me you are worthwhile, for someone to tell me you are beautiful. And the only ones who were willing to tell me that were the crazy holy rollers. Why? It's not a rhetorical question. Why? Why can't we be like that? Why can't humanists, atheists be the ones on the forefront, not just marching, but standing there holding my hand while I'm crying over my dead stepfather's body? Why not? Why not be the ones that are there on the front lines preventing the suicide that is ravaging over the gay teenage Christian community, over the, uh, the Latinas coming to the country, they're fighting between one culture and the other, why not? I was fighting for my identity, and I need your help. There's tons of other Fernandos out there, and they're named Michael, and they're named Saba, and they're named other things. We need the atheist community to be the ones that are out there, not just marching, and not just writing papers, and not just sending money to whatever other organization. 
holding the hands of the kids that are crying because they cannot find meaning in their lives. Let's not forget, my friends, my brothers and my sisters, that yes, we have a mind and a lot of us have suffered because of religion just consumed us with this idea that, oh, emotion is going to save you. I understand it. I am a smart man. I got two degrees and I'm going for my PhD. I am a smart man. But let's not sacrifice the human experience that says we still bleed, we still cry, we still need. Let's reach out for that. Let's put back human, back in humanism. Let's not forget what that means. And maybe, just maybe, I can tell you, I can see how my life, how different it would have been. And there's so many others like that. If we do that, I know, I feel it, I know it, we can change the world. Thank you so much. Let's make a difference. <laughs>